Hi everyone, in today's video I'm going to be talking about the Spalot Almaris turbulence model. This is a bit more of an unusual turbulence model which you may have seen referenced in the literature, in papers and you might often see as an option available in CFD codes when you're coming to set up your simulation. However, there's not a lot of information on this turbulence model, it's quite unusual and it's not clear how to use it. So what I've got for you in this talk is a comprehensive, concise overview of all aspects of the turbulence model. You're going to learn about the history, why it was proposed, what are the main terms in the equation, what do they mean, and what sort of boundary conditions should you apply to the model if you want to use it. So if you've ever been interested in this model or you want to use it for yourself, I know this is going to be a fantastic talk for you. So sit back and I'm going to give you a quick review of the turbulence model. So I'm going to start off with a quick background and then jump straight into the talk. So just a reminder of what we're doing here. Uh, we're considering uh, RAND's turbulence models. That's Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes turbulence models. And for RAND's models, as a reminder, we're solving equation one there, which is the uh, momentum equations and to account for the additional uh, mixing and momentum transfer by the turbulent fluctuations we're using a turbulent or uh, eddy viscosity term there mu t which you can see highlighted in red and that allows us to account for the additional mixing from the additional turbulent fluctuations without modeling them explicitly and in order to apply this mu t in the momentum equation and close the model, we need a method of computing mu t, and that's where the RAND's turbulence model comes in. So most of you will be used to the k epsilon and the k omega turbulence models and the k omega SST models, and in these models, we compute mu t from k and either epsilon or omega. So then we use equation two to calculate the turbulent viscosity there, mu t, which we can then apply back into the momentum equations to solve the RANDS equations. And in order to solve k and either epsilon or omega, we solve an additional scalar transport equation for k, that's there in equation three, and an additional equation for either epsilon or omega. So once we've calculated epsilon and omega at every location in the mesh, we use equation two to calculate the value of mu t in every cell in the mesh and then use that to uh, complete the momentum equation so that we can solve the momentum equations. So that's fairly standard for RAND's turbulence models and you'll be used to the either the k epsilon or the k omega family of models by now. But what happens in the Spalart Almaris turbulence models? Uh, why was it developed and why is it different to these models? So what I'm going to do is just go through a quick history for you so you can understand the significance of the model and why it was proposed. So the K epsilon model was proposed in the early 1970s. So the K epsilon model is definitely the oldest of the models which I'll be talking about here. And the model has obviously had wide, widespread success. It's used uh, fairly widely in a variety of engineering disciplines. But what was found when the K epsilon model was originally proposed and continues to be found uh, today is that the K-Epsilon model is not accurate at predicting uh, boundary layer flows with adverse pressure gradients. So that's particularly challenging for aerofoils and wings at high angles of attack and for turbo machinery applications. And the K-Epsilon model tends to get even worse when shocks are present because that increases the strength of the adverse pressure gradient. So based on these observations, we'd like to have a better turbulence model uh, particularly for these applications and that's where the new models tend to come in. So the Spalot Almaris turbulence model was proposed in 1994 and that's fairly significant when we realize that actually this is around the same time as the K Omega model which was proposed in 1988 and is actually the same year as the K Omega SST model. So these models were proposed simultaneously and they were all aiming to uh, identify and help uh, improve the prediction of the same class of flows, which were uh, boundary layer flows subject to adverse pressure gradients. So now actually taking a look at the model, what is it and how does it work? The first thing we need to do before we actually look at the, the equations is actually understand what we're trying to do when we solve them. And the way I'm gonna do that is first by considering how 
does the turbulent or kinematic viscosity actually behave near the wall? So what behavior are we expecting from this quantity? So first, what I want you to think about is just the flow of a, a boundary layer flow developing over a flat plate. And you can see a little sketch of that uh, on the slides there. And what I've got for you plotted there is the uh, turbulent kinematic viscosity. So that's just mu t divided by the density uh, with distance normal to the wall y plus. And it's that red line that I want you to be looking at. You may not have seen this plot before because it's quite unusual and it's not often shown in uh, in user manuals and in textbooks, but you can uh, find this plot if you want in page five of the reference that I'm going to uh, leave for you below. And it really helps understand a lot of why uh, the spalar almaris turbulence model was proposed and what it actually does. So the variation of this quantity normal to the wall given by that red line there, which you can see in the figure. And actually in the logarithmic region, far from the wall, you can see that the profile is essentially linear. And near the wall, the profile is a bit more complicated, and it turns out that it varies with the fourth power of y plus. But now that we've got an understanding of actually how the turbulent eddy viscosity varies near to the wall, we can actually start to think about a model that we might use if we wanted to calculate this quantity. So just repeating what I showed you there from the previous slide, in the log law region, the profile is linear. However, in that viscous sublayer very close to the wall, the profile is quartic. It varies with y plus to the four. So if we're using a CFD code, remember that in CFD codes, the flow quantities all vary linearly across the cells, and we're limited by that in CFD codes. So what that would mean in practice is that if we wanted to compute this profile, we'd have to have a lot of cells normal to the wall. We'd have to have very, very thin cells close to the wall if we wanted to have enough cells to uh, correctly represent this variation. So perhaps is there something a bit more clever that we can do to get around this behavior close to the wall? So the trick with the spalot almaris turbulence model is not to solve for new t, but it's to solve for a variable that's very similar to new t. And this is often used the notation new tilde, which you can see there on the slide. And what is new tilde? Well, new tilde is very similar to new t, and it's actually the profile given by the dashed line, which you can see there in the figure. And the dashed line is linear all the way to the wall. So what that means is this new variable that we're going to solve for, new tilde, is actually identical to new t close to the wall, uh, far away from the wall, but close to the wall, it's slightly different and it behaves linearly. And the reason we want to do this is it makes it a lot easier to solve for numerically. So our solution is going to be a lot more stable and we also don't need as many cells if we want to capture this profile. So how do we do that in practice? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to solve a transport equation for new tilde. So rather than k or epsilon, we're going to solve only one transport equation for new tilde, which is the straight line profile. And once we have that straight line profile, we're going to, as a post-processing operation, multiply it by this function fv1, which you can see there on the slide. And that has some kind of cubic behavior multiplied by linear behavior. So it'll be quartic to the power four, and that will allow us to recover new t, which we can then uh, multiply by the density, you can see there in equation seven, and put straight back into the momentum equations. So that's how we're going to solve the system with the Spalot Almaris model. We're going to solve for new tilde, multiply it by uh, a function to capture that quartic variation, and then that gives us new t, which we can then put into the momentum equations. So quite a simple model once we understand what it's trying to do. And just a reminder of what we've done here is that for a flat plate boundary layer, so that was the example problem we looked at, we know that new tilde is going to be linear with distance from the wall. However, it's always important to remember that for our CFD geometry, generally, we're not going to have a flat plate. We're going to have a general geometry. And so new tilde is not going to be linear close to the wall. However, it's very likely that new tilde will be close to linear as we get close to the wall. And so we're going to solve a transport equation for new tilde, and it's likely that this variation is going to be very close to linear, which will make it easy to solve. And then when we've done that, again, we multiply by this function fv1, and that allows us to recover new t, which we use in the momentum equations. So what is the transport equation that we solve? Well, I've put for you the full transport equation for new tilde, which you can see there on the screen. And 
As a reminder, even though it looks very complicated, the solution will tend to be close to linear. And so actually numerically, when we try and solve this, it should be fairly straightforward and will converge fairly rapidly. But of course, there are a lot of terms in the equation and so it can look quite confusing at first glance. So what I'm gonna do for you here is just go through the terms one by one so you get an understanding of what they actually mean when you're trying to interpret it. So the first term is on the left-hand side, we've got the temporal derivative and the convection term you can see there with the nabla dot behavior. And these two terms are fairly common regardless of what transport equation you're solving. They allow us to convect our variable across the flow field in space and time. And because these terms are very standard, I'm not gonna go into any detail about these terms any further. They're exactly the same as you see in all transport equations in CFD. But let's focus on those terms on the right hand side because they're a bit more confusing and you may not have seen them before. The first term on the right hand side gives us the generation of turbulence. So we want our model to be able to generate turbulence in regions of high shear, which will replicate uh, turbulent generation behavior uh, in real flows. And the way that the Spalot Almaris turbulence model does this and the way it generates shear is by assuming that the generation, so it's a positive term, is proportional to the shear rate in the mean velocity gradient. So that's that big letter S you can see there. And you'll often see the letter S for shear rate in a lot of turbulence models. And we're proposing that when we have a shearing mean velocity profile, that generates turbulence. And the way I often think of this is in the diagram, which you can see there on the slide. You can see that if you have a uniform profile, there's no shear, and so we're not gonna produce any turbulence. But as soon as we have shear in our velocity field, then if you look at those velocity vectors, one vector is gonna be moving faster than the other. And because one's moving faster than the other, that will tend to generate a rotation. And of course, a rotation is a large eddy, and this will slowly decay into smaller eddies and will generate turbulence. So that might be a useful way for you to think about how turbulence is generated by shear in a mean velocity profile. And the way we calculate it is given there by equation 15. So that's the first term. The first term is just allows us to generate turbulence in regions of high shear in our solution. What about the other terms? So the first thing I wanna point out is that transport equations often contain a diffusion term. And the diffusion term allows quantities to spread out from regions of high concentration to regions of low concentration. And diffusion terms always take a common form, which I've got highlighted with the underbrace there you can see on the slides. There's a diffusion term in the turbulent kinetic energy equation, in the equation for epsilon, and in the momentum equation. We always have a diffusion term of the form nabla dot, and then some quantity which controls the rate of diffusion, and then the gradient of that quantity, because we always diffuse down a concentration gradient. So we expect to have a diffusion term in our spalat almaris turbulence model as well. And it turns out we do have a diffusion term if we look closely. We've got that nabla dot, which you can see there in the underbrace term, and then we've got a gradient of the new tilde term, which we can see there. So we definitely do have a diffusion term in the spalat almaris turbulence model, and that allows uh, profiles to spread out, which is what we expect. However, the difference here, and the reason we might find this term confusing, is that there's an additional non-linear term, which I've highlighted in red there. That's a, the gradient of uh, new tilde squared, so that's definitely a non-linear term. And we don't often see those uh, in transport equations. And if you go back to the, if you look at the original paper, which I'll link in the description, you'll see this uh, non-linear term talked about. And the reason the authors added it is they use this term to control the spreading of the wake at the edge of a turbulent region. So just to give you an idea of what that actually means, because it can be quite difficult to picture in your head, if we have some kind of a wake or a velocity profile away from any boundaries, then that wake will tend to spread out, it will tend to diffuse. And actually when the authors introduced this term and calibrated it, they wanted to control the spread of the wake and to make the wake spread at the correct rate that they can match uh, with experiments. And this might be important, for example, downstream uh, of an aerofoil or a diffusing section in a duct. And so that additional nonlinear term, just to remind you there, is only added just to control the spread of wakes far away from the wall. So at this point, I haven't talked about actually what happens at the wall at all. 
All the terms we've seen are valid anywhere in the flow, regardless of if there's a wall or not. But we expect to have some additional terms that will tend to damp turbulence as we get closer to the wall. And that's going to be the final term that we look at. But before I do, just a, a quick side note of the uh, diffusion term. Uh, in equation 20, you can see I've, un I've underlined the diffusion term there with the underbrace, and that's the form of the equation that you'll see in the original paper. If you read the original uh, 1994 paper, you'll see it written in this form. However, a lot of authors and in a lot of uh, the source, the user manuals and the source code on the internet, you'll see that diffusion term actually split up with the nonlinear term brought outside. And the reason that we do that is to keep the uh, diffusion term, the original diffusion term, linear, and then the source term, because it's nonlinear, we treat that in an explicit form. So we add it on using the values from the previous iteration. And that's generally the way that the source terms are treated. So if you're ever reading up on this model in the literature and you're confused as to why the terms might look slightly different, or you're not sure why, this is why, as the diffusion term is split up into two so that the linear part can be treated in the standard way and then that extra non-linear bit that the authors added in we can treat of we can treat as an explicit source term so anyway now i want to go back and talk about the destruction of turbulence so this is the final term which you'll see there right on the right hand side of the spalot almaris turbulence model and what i want you to think about is when we're close to a wall whether that's uh, an aerofoil surface or a wall of a diffuser or some other geometry we expect the wall to physically destroy turbulence and the way it does this is by a combination of blocking pressure fluctuations that we have in the unsteady turbulent field and then very close to the wall the viscosity tends to damp the turbulence directly so there are two effects we've got the inviscid blocking of the pressure fluctuations and the viscous damping very close to the wall. And this term, which we can see on the right hand side, has a negative has a negative sign, so it's definitely going to destroy turbulence, it's going to reduce the value of new tilde. And we've got a quantity d there, which is the distance to the nearest wall. So as we get closer to the wall, we expect the destruction of turbulence to increase, so we're going to get more damping and so you can see that this term is on the bottom of the fraction so as we get closer to the wall we're going to damp more turbulence and there's an additional function fw there which also tends to zero as we tend to the wall so we're not going to get a divide by zero error which we might expect if we took that final term right close to the wall so that's all we have is that this final term uh, indicates the destruction of turbulence we're going to be destroying turbulence as we get close to the wall but it's important to note that this term is only accounting for the inviscid blocking. So that's the blocking uh, of the pressure fluctuations that we would have if we were solving uh, the full set of equations. And it doesn't account for the viscous damping. That's very important to realize. If you actually read the paper for yourself, it can be quite confusing. But the viscous damping is actually accomplished through that function FV1, which we saw at the very start of the talk because FV1 is going to be active very close to the wall and it's imposing that quartic behavior close to the wall on new T, which implicitly uh, contains a lot of the uh, viscous uh, destruction terms. And just a small side note there, that there are a few other mod uh, modifications to the strain rate and a few other quantities to account for uh, viscous damping. But so far in this talk, I just wanted to give you an overview the main aspects of the model so don't worry if things start to get a bit more confusing here you should have definitely got a good grasp of the main aspects of the model and how it works so now just to wrap up I just want to talk about what boundary conditions you might apply to this model if you're going to use it so actually it turns out in addition to the variable new tilde being uh, very stable uh, numerically it's often very close to linear near the wall the boundary conditions are very simple and straightforward to apply as well so because new tilde varies linearly with distance from the wall, the correct boundary condition to apply at the wall is just new tilde is zero at any wall, which is nice and simple for us to apply in our CFD codes. But what do we apply uh, in the free stream? So far away from our aerofoil surface or for our walls, we might have a turbulent free stream, a turbulent wind, uh, for example. What kind of values would we apply to new tilde there? So if you remember back to what we talked about before, 
far away from the wall, new tilde is actually identical to the turbulent kinematic viscosity. And so we can just apply the same inlet conditions that we would on the turbulent uh, kinematic viscosity on new tilde. And so what we tend to do is we calculate a value for K and then epsilon or omega, and then just divide those. And that's how we would calculate our inlet value uh, for new tilde. And for those of you who aren't aware, often uh, we specify a turbulence intensity, typically 5% and a length scale at the inlets to our domains. And we can use the equations that I've got for you there in equation 26 to calculate values of K, epsilon and omega that we apply for our uh, CFD simulations. And uh, some CFD codes like ANSYS Fluent will do this for you. You just specify an intensity and a length scale and it will calculate these inlet values for you. Uh, but if you don't have that, you can always use, uh, there are several online calculators. There's one on my website, for example, or you can just uh, calculate and use the equations as they are there. But to really summarize that slide, new tilde is zero at all the walls. And then in the free stream, we just apply the same boundary conditions that we would do for the turbulent kinematic viscosity. So it really is a very straightforward and simple model to implement for the user. So just to finish off with a summary of what I've talked about here, in the spalot almaris turbulence model, we're solving a transport equation for new tilde, which is very similar to the turbulent kinematic viscosity, but it's not the same. And the reason we do this is it's a lot easier to solve for numerically because the behavior is very likely to be close to linear when we get near to the wall. And then after we've solved this transport equation for new tilde everywhere in our domain, we multiply by that quartic function and that allows us to calculate new t. So we calculate new t as a post-processing operation. Once we have new t, we can use that to close and solve the momentum equations so that we can solve the system of Rand's equations. But we don't need to solve any additional equations for k or epsilon or omega in these models. Now, it's also worth making a small side point at the end, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, that often the k omega sst model is preferred to the spalot almaris turbulence model uh, for the majority of aerodynamics applications. And this is principally because both models were introduced at the same time, around 1994. However, since that time, there's been a lot of comparative, uh, comparative testing uh, by a variety of uh, groups of people. And generally, the K-Omega SST model has been found to give better behavior. So that's why for the majority of uh, simulations that you'll perform, the K-Omega SST model tends to be used tends to be preferred and should be recommended in most cases. So that brings me to the end of the talk. I realized that I've only really scratched the surface of this turbulence model and there's definitely a lot more that needs to be considered. So if you really want to go into more detail for this model, uh, just check out the references, which I'll leave in the description uh, below this video, and you can go in a lot more detail and look at the turbulence model a bit more. However, the stuff I've given you here should be a great first start so you actually understand what the terms are and uh, what the paper's referring to when they talk about these terms. Um, and at this point, once again, I'd just like to thank you all for continuing to support my channel and watch the videos. Uh, I really appreciate it. So if you have any thoughts, uh, comments, suggestions, just leave them in the comment section below and I look forward to hearing from you.